Our fathers, this day we raise our hearts in the hope of the perfect resurrection manifesting for us individually and for the world collectively. The mystery of the flowers as they burst into bloom each springtime, the mysteries of life, the mysteries of the spiritual world and of that which lies beyond the stars causes us at times to tremble with joy and anticipation of all that thou, O God, hast in store for us. We hold up the very hem of our garments that thou, O God, mayest touch them with thy hand and hallow those garments, changing them from glory unto glory, even by the electronic essence of thyself, which composes all substance and has the power to change and has the power to resurrect and has the power to immortalize of ourselves in our finite world in our egoistic consciousness, we can do nothing. But with thee, we can do all things. And in thy name, I am, we claim our spiritual inheritance with joy and find a place of refuge in thy heart. Thou hast been called the rock of ages. And we envision today that lively stone which represents the essence of solidity, of fixation in righteousness. And we hold to it, we cling to it, and to the cross of light, and to the magnificence of the cosmic path that leads to the summit of idealization, of God idealization, of reality, of the sunlight of thy love, of the healing rays pouring throughout the universe of the interconnecting faith between hearts and of the borders of thy kingdom. We decree then this day in the name of Almighty God that the family of nations and the family of religions and the family of hearts shall come with under the banner of thy love and shall then raise that banner on high. For I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. Thou, O Christ, the great magnet, pour thy love then over the world this day and see to it that to the uttermost parts of the earth the light is carried, the torch is aflame, and the hearts of the world are touched. They have grown bored by spiritual thoughts. They have grown bored by that which is devoid of vitality. Infuse us then with that day-to-day -day spirit of the resurrection, vitality, that changes the very atmosphere in which we move and charges the world with the essence of that power that in Christ manifested upon the hillside and drew and magnetized the people unto him. We seek not to raise people unto ourselves, but to raise them unto thee. We seek not to magnify or glorify ourselves, but to glorify thee. We seek to glorify thee in every heart and to bring in thy kingdom. For this purpose we came into the world, and this is our raison d'etre. We ask thee then to consecrate us above our poor power to do so, to raise us above our poor power to do so, and to hold us ever in thy heart and in thy arms, and help us to be a comforting presence to life, to everyone upon the planetary body, to those in sin and darkness and shadow. May we bring light to those in sickness May we bring health to all people everywhere. May we bring peace and may thy love encircle the world as a swaddling garment of immortal purity that brings in the millennium of thy presence, the thousand years of perfection following this season of Armageddon when nations are turned against nations, when people are turned against people, when the whispering of the malignant gossip entity sweeps across the world and seeks to tear and gnaw at the vital organism of the living Christ. We ask then that you will replace all of that 
by the power of unity, by the power of Christ's magnificence, by the power of the spiritual press. We ask you to replace the material press of the world, the press that seeks to put out news of hate and hate campaigns, smear campaigns and viciousness, to destroy nations and peoples and kindreds and tongues, to disunify and to disrupt, to disturb the consciousness, shall be replaced by the press of our beloved ascended masters that shall seek to expand all over the world the understanding that will live in Christ and grow in magnificence until the world will have the knowledge, including the youth of the world, that will bring freedom in the name of Saint Germain to the earth and to all people thereupon. May the dove of the Holy Comforter descend upon the chalice of men's hearts this day in memory of the resurrection, and may they know, and may they be, and may they purified stand within the center of thy law, and by thy command go forth to do thy will upon the earth. Truly thy work is our own, and we make it so by offering thee our hands, our hearts, and our heads in thy service, in thy consecration, and in thy name I am. The glory of the Easter message is upon us this day. We stand today 2,000 years from the cross of Golgotha. We are today Christian in the sense that we love Christ but universal in the sense that Christ the light is universal. We bear no malice to any man. To our beloved Muslim brethren, the followers of Mohammed, we send greetings and our love. To our Buddhist brothers in the temples throughout the Far East, we send our love. To those who follow Taoism, and every other faith, including those we have not mentioned, we send our love. And throughout Christendom, to our Catholic brethren from the Church of Rome, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Nazarenes, every little sect, the disciples of Christ, the Moravians, and even the Dunkards, and all of these other people throughout the world, we send our love because the spirit of unity was the manifestation of the seamless garment of the Christ. It is impossible that we should think that we serve his purpose or serve his cause if we possess in our hearts a feeling of hate toward any part of life. One of the problems of our world today, a problem which is often misunderstood, is the fact that there are many people in political office throughout this land, yet not all, who are doing despot to their office. They dishonor the purposes for which they were seated. Also, we have a great deal of inequity in the commercial world, where man is cheating man and bringing about a constant state of decay through planned obsolescence. The dollar and human greed has often distorted our mind, and those who recognize the inequity of that and realize that this is unfair, that these people are doing despot to this nation and in every way to all nations, often resort to a campaign of smear and in some cases a statement of the truth, in some cases a distortion of the truth, in other cases the defamation of the character of men in public office, in many cases this defamation is just, and so forth. However, I would like to point out to you that we cannot live in the vibratory action of a certain campaign of hate and fear 364 days out of the year and then on Easter Sunday lay aside the hate that we have dwelled in and allowed to use our consciousness, we must use the consciousness of the Christ 365 days a year. There is a specific plan 
of world negation that is involved in all of this spread of hate and hate campaign. People feel because a thing is true or partially true that it justifies the conducting of hate campaigns against races, against creeds, against ideas, against individuals, and against political figures. There is no justification whatsoever in it because the hate campaigns cannot possibly produce the fruit of love. In reality, when people are doing wrong things and we hate them for it and we smear them for it or we spread abroad their wrongdoings, we do not produce the fruit of correct doings by spreading abroad these hate campaigns. We merely corrode our soul. We bring our soul down into the vibratory action of fear, of torment, of wondering what is happening to the earth, to our nation, and to our world. If instead of taking our energy in reading anything that is defamatory, anything that is inflammatory, anything that is destructive, we would read the Ascended Master's Law and consecrate upon Christ's ideals and pray for those who despitefully use the world and seek to be noble citizens of this land and of every land in which we live, we would then be enthroning cosmic Christ integrity before the eyes of the world and that which we would enthrone would then be picked up by the consciousness of those receptive politicians and individuals in the business world who would begin to reflect a little more of the light of the Christ. There is a very sinister and malignant activity involved in all of this spread of hate in our world today. It brings the people downward into a spire of degradation that moves downward and destroys the Christ image in their own consciousness as well as in the consciousness of others. And because energy is that for which we are accountable, we who engage in such activities, if we do, are victims then of our own wrongdoing. Malignancy flourishes in our consciousness instead of the beauty of Christ's identification. Let us then understand that this day on Easter, the Great White Brotherhood has desired that I should express these comments to you as the beginning of an organized effort to reverse the campaigns of hate upon this planet which are conducted in many cases by splendid people. They work very hard digging up facts about certain politicians. They work very hard digging up facts about certain commercial people and how they are defrauding the public, how automobiles are being builded without proper safety factors, how light bulbs are being given a fixed life by the miracle of engineering science which could give them almost permanent life, how we are being victims in the commercial world of the cupidity of men who feel that profit justifies every motive in that which they do. We must recognize that they are wrong, but we cannot afford to indulge ourselves in those wrongs any more than we would indulge ourselves in the act of murder. If individuals committed murder, and we know it occurs throughout our nation daily, we must understand that for us to sit and meditate, to think upon the act of murder, would never in any way free us to actually perform our duties as natives of this universe and natives of this world. As natives of God's kingdom, we must uphold a standard that seeks to break the back of that which is bondage by ourselves dwelling in the consciousness of the Christ. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus the Christ with his consciousness standing up and constantly denouncing mankind without seeking to raise them up? There is a time and there is a place when it is necessary to pinpoint a certain activity. There are times when we must do it, but you do not have to do it in order to generate hate in the part of the people. What you perhaps need to do is generate an aversion for evil in the hearts of the people. Create a picture in their mind that this is an undesirable thing to do, but certainly not attempt to create either race hatred or anything else regardless of what lies behind it. We know that there are many, many evil people in the world, but as the masters have said, 
If they knew better, they would do better. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do should be our plea today. And we should work to become citizens of the world of such a caliber as to change the world by our own conduct rather than a constant denunciation of that which is evil in our society. That which is evil can only be mended permanently by the raising of the level of the consciousness of all citizens of this great land, by a renewal of interest in the things of the spirit, and by consecrating the youth of this world to a higher idealism than that which is currently manifesting. There are many hungry hearts in the university, and they dare not in many cases open their mouths for fear of ostracization by their fellow men. We must recognize then that as adults and as representatives of the spiritual hierarchy, we have a very definite responsibility toward life to try to quicken by the spirit of the resurrection the power of faith in their consciousness and in the consciousness of the world. We must inflame men with a love for God rather than inflame their hearts with hate. We must understand that hate must be stamped out and replaced by love, that love will work no evil to its neighbor, that love will uphold at all times the laws of life that brought the universe into birth. We then must recognize the nobleness of man and not permit ourselves to be twisted by the strange idea that a thing is evil. If it is evil, it will fall of its own weight, for it cannot long endure, because God is not evil, and God is light, and God created all things, but he did not create evil. Evil is an energy veil spawned by man and woven over the pure light substance by the misqualification of energy. That cannot stand as the light is invoked. When the light is invoked, it is the indomitable spirit of the resurrection that blazes forth throughout the world. The spirit of the resurrection is an active principle in man. The spirit of the resurrection is that which breaks the rock of materiality. It rolls the stone away from the tomb. It exhumes from all that is decadent and evil the energies of evil and transmutes them into the power of the sunlight of God's love. This is reality. This is that which we seek and which we must be. This is the manifestation of the color of nature. All of the flowers reflect the rainbow rays of God's love. Harmony and beauty in architecture is often a result of the symmetry of nature. And we must understand that the beauty of God in our world today is truly found in nature rather than in man. And yet man is also the offspring of God. And as the offspring of God, man ought to manifest that beauty that we find in nature. And thus nature should draw her inspiration from man, the higher, rather than today, man, the lower, drawing his inspiration from nature, the lower. We have looked at the footstool kingdom of God. And as we have looked at the footstool kingdom, our hearts have been enthralled. We have examined the ants as sluggards. We have looked down and noticed that the ant civilization is almost superior to our own. There the communal effort is understood. We must recognize that we are a world community. We do not wish to become a communistic community, but a communal community, one which understands the need to work for one another's good without bringing tyranny to bear as pressure upon some part of life in order to assert our individualistic purposes. We must recognize that the spirit of truth is abroad in the world today and that that is the spirit of Christ, that that is the mastery which he taught that brings to the world the exhalation of the holy breath and by that holy breath brings that exhilaration which lifts us all up in consciousness to where we really understand what life is about. The ministry today have failed throughout our land. They have failed utterly to understand the divine purposes. They seem to have reduced the mastery of the universe to a creed to be believed, to an idea or a concept. Life is multifaceted. It is filled and flooded with light because God himself is light. We are individual monads, reflecting then the quality of that light, but possessing the power to draw within our heart flame the magnificent manifestation and magnification of the threefold flame by which we become self-generating individuals. As self-generating individuals, we are able to regenerate ourselves in the image of the Christ, to wear the seamless garment of his love, and to be as he was, a healer to all parts of life. We must learn to heal. We must learn to bless. 
We must learn to consecrate. We must learn to shun the appearance of evil, and we must stand up stalwart in this day and age for the purposes that we came into being for. If we will do that, even the few that are here by relative comparison to the many that are in St. Patrick's Cathedral, we will understand that the world can be changed through our consciousness. Change your mind and you change your world. Accept the truth of the living Christ as a reality blazing within your own heart. Understand then that citizenship in the world merits your attention to the problems of the world, but not by criticism, by condemnation, and by judgment, for these are not constructive ideations. They produce no good fruit, but bring about always a lowering of the vibratory nature of the world of the individual. Until the world learns this, until the yellow journalism of the world and the smear campaigns, the tactics of hate, and the degeneration of people's consciousness is stopped, the world will continue to be a place where there is a regurgitation of all that is destructive, and the realities of life are bypassed for the destructive elements. Understand this, and you understand life. Understand that men have made marplots of you. Understand that we are all victims of world hate. We are all victims of world attempts to dominate. We are all victims of man's commercial greed today. And the taxations and excess taxations wrecked upon mankind are reflective of this. Also, the waste and spending and extravagance in our nation is actually a waste of our economy. But we do it in our individual worlds and homes. We do not always provide that order for ourselves which God has provided as heaven's first law. Therefore, today is our opportunity to reckon with it all, to understand for once and for all time that we can see and judge the parent tree by its fruit. For the fruit does not fall far from the parent tree. And the fruit of evil is always evil. The fruit of good is always good. And so long as men desire to expand the teachings of the living Christ in the world of form, they will not utter words of hate or oppression against their neighbor. They will understand that tyranny itself must go down. And as Thomas Jefferson said, all of us together ought to swear upon the altar of our heart eternal hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man, whether it is hate or oppression or greed or destructivity or egoism. For selfishness itself has wrecked many problems in our world, destroyed many homes and happy marriages. And selfishness itself is an act that ought to incense us against the deed. And we ought to recognize that we should not hate people but we should despise the activity of evil in ourselves and thus rid ourselves for once and for all by the power of Christ consciousness of that which defrauds us of life. Let us then, this day, enter in to a renewed consecration to the divine intention. The divine intentions for the world are peace and goodwill to all upon earth. The star of the east that shone in our world at the birth of our Savior is also the light from heaven that rolls away the stone from the tomb. Thank you. Sixty point oh one Transfiguring Affirmations is taught by beloved Jesus the Christ to his disciples. We give this together in the spirit of the resurrection, together. I am that I am. I am the open door which no man can shut. I am the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the ascension in the light. I am the fulfillment of all my needs and requirements of the hour. I am abundant supply poured out upon all life. I am perfect sight and hearing. I am the manifest perfection of being. I am the illimitable light of God made manifest everywhere. I am the light of the Holy of Holies. I am the Son of God. I am the light in the holy mountain of God. 
many years ago, when the summit first started, at Easter, Jesus dictated a beautiful pearl together with Kathumi. And in connection with it, I do not remember just how it was brought about, a poem came forth. Several weeks ago, at my request, Elizabeth and Sigrid sat down and working with certain melodies, worked out a melody and adapted it to this poem. The number of it is 138 in your hymnal. It is called Jesus Victorious Crown. And I feel that this poem will bless you as it has us this Easter morning. On my tie, a caduceus, a winged caduceus. This which has been utilized by the medical profession as a symbol of the profession is in reality the son of righteousness that has arisen with healing in his wings. The spinal column is the staff. The curling energies around it, moving to the right in a right spiral, are the regenerative energies, the energies of the regeneration, moving from the base of the spine to the sublime spiritual eye. This then brings man's consciousness up to the winged solar disk worn by the ancients and by many of the masters in ancient Atlantis, where the golden sun disk upon the brow covers the third spiritual eye. This third spiritual eye easily penetrates through the golden substance and actually charges it with the fire of the sun. The wings then that were worn on the brow of the masters were symbolical of the spiritual uplift, the radiation, the raising in stature and an initiation, an initiatic level. All of this then is called a caduceus action, and it brings man from a state of base desire to a state of spiritual aspiration, which, if men care to say, I prefer to dally a while longer yet, they must understand that it is the only ultimate way to life. Jesus himself had a series of embodiments upon the earth planet, and this, of course, is no desecration. 
when you understand it all. He was, as some of you realize, Abel, the son of Adam. And as Abel, the one who slew him was Cain, who later embodied as Judas Iscariot. And therefore, the statement where it says that the blood of all men from righteous Abel through the prophet should be upon them the generation that should slay the Son of God. So we see then that the Christ, Abel, who moved also through the circuit of time and embodiment into manifestation as a son of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he became Joseph, the idle dreamer, and he wore the coat of many colors, symbolizing the rainbow rays of God. But much later, when he had advanced and attained his Christhood completely, the many-colored coat became the seamless white light garment. We have learned then that men do follow one another's course. And so the twelve sons of Jacob, the heads of the twelve tribes of Israel, were also the brothers of Joseph, and yet the brother who sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt and into the bond of the Pharaoh was again Cain, Judas. And so he was betrayed. When he came across the hills of Nazareth much later, and he sought these twelve life streams, his twelve brothers, he called them and they obeyed him instantly because there was that instinctive tie of brotherhood within them, and they were the circle of twelve. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not Mark, he was uh, not involved in this, but Matthew, Luke, and John. We'll have to leave Mark out. He was only a little boy at the time, as you saw in the picture yesterday. But the point is that the others, the twelve actual disciples, they were called by Jesus, and they responded, and there were the twelve tribes of Israel, you see. Jesus composing, now then the 13th. But it's a very interesting thing that along in there, my own life stream got mixed up quite a bit with all this, and even Elizabeth. But this is something I prefer not to go into too much. But I will say this, that among all of Jesus' embodiments, he was also David. Now I realize that some people may not, you don't have to accept this if you don't want to, but... It's perfectly all right. I'm telling you what I received from the Master, and if it disagrees with what you've received, don't worry about it. I'm not crushing you with my thought. But I was given a very definite revelation that it was David, and therefore, when he said, Thou wilt not suffer thine Holy One to see corruption or leave my soul in hell, he prophesied of himself in that time to come when he would have achieved his victory. For he could hardly achieve his victory, although he was a man after God's heart, when he had his 600 concubines, and when he stole the wife of Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba, and from that union was born Solomon. And yet of David it was said, he is a man after my own heart. Certainly God then was not expressing that he approved of the concubines nor any of that activity. But he recognized the contriteness of the heart of David. We recognize that he had to attain his ascension. And that was the final point when they said we have seen his star in the east. Now you take note of this if you can get this on the inner when the wise men, the Magi, said, we have seen his star in the east, they were not referencing someone that had not been to earth before. Because everyone has a star. Did you know that? Every person has a star. And when you leave the body, in a sense of the word, your star is now placed in the inner. And before your birth, your star comes forth. You also have an angel. You have a star and an angel. Every person has that. And of course, in a very real sense, we reference our own presence as our angel, the angel of the present. But there's many mysteries to life. Life is really one, and yet it is diversified into many. This is my body which was broken for you. The body of God has enabled us all to enjoy the Father's love. Otherwise, God himself would have been alone. He says, it is not good for man to be alone, all one, you see. So I will make a help me for it. And so the Lord God fashioned out of the rib of Adam, you see, this Eve, which really is I Eve. And here we see the mystery of Isis revealed, Isis unveiled. Because Isis is really very simple when you know Sensar. So I'm going to tell it to you for once and for all so that you'll understand it. It's so simple that you may almost laugh at me. Isis simply means is, is. 
and it refers to the duality of life. The first is denoting the man that is of the earth earthy, and the second man denoting the reality. One is the pseudo-self, the other is the divine self, and the veil that lies between shows that transition must be accomplished. Therefore, the veil of Isis is simply the veil of that which is real and that which is pseudo. <laughs> but you see, you don't get these except at Luxor. I mean, you don't understand it. I've told it to you. Now you know. But you see, you could have gotten it for yourself just as easily as I got it. But the point is, but what this really means and stands for, the whole epistle that goes with each sacred mystery is never given to you except at the feet of the Master. And you can get it. You can get it from the Master, but don't go into delusion. I want to specifically at this time point out to you that there is grave danger in people getting messages from supposed messages from Masters that tell them to do things that are irrational or that are depriving them of their life. One of the most terrible things, I think, in the world is a very specific concept that caters to the ego. If I could only get this across to you this morning, it would be worth your whole trip here. I hadn't planned on doing it, but I do think it would be very wonderful. Don't ever misunderstand what I say, please, because it is a very great mystery, and yet I run a risk in telling it to you that you'll think that I think something different than what I do. So please don't misinterpret it. Take it on its basic context. From time to time, I have encountered individuals along the spiritual path that come to me for counseling or come to me to tell me something about themselves. Many times these people will make specific statements. And one of the statements we always notice that follows the crushing of their ego by the law is the fact that I am now beyond the range of the ascended masters. I no longer need to decree. I no longer need the violet flame. I am above the violet flame. I do not need to have a master because I go directly to God. I don't need St. Germain or Jesus because I have found the way to God. Uh, I don't need the pearls of wisdom anymore because I get directly taught by the masters. Every single one of these instances I have taken before the karmic board and every single time I have found that the people were egotistical. Every person that has done this has been egotistical and although they thought they were very spiritual and so forth, it was in reality a holier-than-thou attitude, a seducing spirit that had taken a hold of them and made them to think that they were something special. Well, everyone's special in God's eyes. God would not be God and have a favorite son. The favorite son is the son that does the father's will. At that point, he raises himself into preeminence, and then no one need dispute it. But when individuals feel that they are above true spiritual organization, they become a law unto themselves. I took this up with Master El Moria one time, and he said to me, he said, some of these and most of them, are solitary climbers upon the mountain of attainment. He said, we see them often, and their carcasses lie broken on the rocks below. They refuse, he said, to be roped together with others that climb toward the summit. They prefer to go it alone. He said, we do not interfere with them. He said, we let them go. But he said, their bones are bleached in the sun, and they are in the crevasses. Because it's almost practically impossible for an individual to attain alone. But I don't speak these words to condemn these people, nor do I speak these words to condemn any man, but I speak them in defense of the living truth because I know that when I go to a conference like this, even if I sat in the audience rather than on the platform, that if it's a sincere conference sponsored by the Ascended Master, I receive good from it, and I need that good. I need the fellowship with my brethren. I need the teachings of the brethren from above. I am not above the law. I am under the law of love. And I am grateful for the messages of the Master, for their inspiration. I want to tell you something that is absolutely true, however. The Masters have been very generous in these conferences. They have given us a wealth of good. 
Some of it is almost overpowering to our human consciousness. But make no mistake about it. It is truly a great blessing. However, there is a tendency for individuals to appraise the first hearing of a dictation, the first time they ever hear one, as the greatest experience of their life. And then, through familiarity and inattention to old habit, thought, and feeling, to gaze upon it in a different way, and after a while to become bored with the fact that some words are reused again and again, some ideas, some thought matrices. I will say to you all, good morning. You have said it countless times. You will say it again. People will say, how are you? I'm feeling fine. These expressions are necessary. The masters know that there are 26 letters in our alphabet. Out of those 26 letters, all of the smut peddlers of the world have created all of their nasty periodicals. And the words that they have used are evil. But also the Holy Bible is written with those same letters. It is in the use of objects that we learn to respect them. And it is use that makes something sublime or ridiculous. I know that decrees are new to people today because St. Germain didn't take the wraps off on it till in the 1930s, I believe, or the late 1920s. But nevertheless, no one in their right mind that works for a while with decrees will ever be able to make the progress that they can make with decrees in any other way. You just simply cannot do it because in the yogic method, you have the mind made of blank or concentrating on a point of light and so you go out into nirvana. I've gone out into space and I've mingled with the universe and with the saints out there. But actually, as Maurya told me one time, he said, our whole country of India is full of yogis sitting there in meditation and some of them are master yogis and he said the cows are roaming the streets and eating the food of the people and ignorance is everywhere. So Maurya said in the meantime these yogis instead of working to heal their nation to provide for food and understanding to the ignorant masses they have continued to have their sacred cows and get into their fights smear the gung-ho on their foreheads and all of this stuff but what are they actually doing as far as changing the world? Moria said, this is what they should do is change the world. Now, Moria L. lived in India and has been in India. He knows India thoroughly, believe me. And Moria knows all these conditions and Moria is working to change it. And every one of the masters of the Great White Brotherhood are. But every yogic master is not a member of the Great White Brotherhood. Just remember that. You can be a yogic master and you can even heal, you can levitate, you can spread the odor of roses around a room. You can become famous. And that's one of the things, of course, that is a strange situation because in a sense, while these yogis are not really black magicians and they're not following the left-handed path, there is a certain path that you can follow in that line that seeks the glorification of the ego. There is a form of mastership that people can seek where they do it for the sake of phenomena and demonstration of their own attainment. This is like a great carpenter or a great musician or someone desiring to show off what they can do. Now, it's not wrong to do it. It's wrong to show it off. You don't have to show it off if it's good. People already know it. People are not dumb. They have good appreciation. People that really appreciate good things when they see it. So you don't have to show it off. But you know these people do it. And they'd have so much joy in life if they would not seek to have their name glorified. If they just seek to glorify the work itself, they would all be better off because God gives you some special interior enjoyment as St. John of the Cross pointed out. A special interior enjoyment all of your own. And you know, after all, no one can enjoy your life for you except yourself. And you think about that. So thank you.